Um, hello, everyone. This is the almost last discussion part of our seminar week. We'll be speaking today about digital transformation, for which we ask Lucas, Huck, and, and Amy Lorinx to answer our questions. So we're welcome to both of you. I will shortly introduce you. Lucas works for the startup Signu as vice president and product management and digital assets since 2018. Signum is a globally operating regulated digital asset bank founded in 2017. The company aims to empower institutional corporates and private investors, as well as banks and other financial institutions to invent, invest in the digital asset economy. Lucas Hook main focus is on digital transformation, banking and blockchain technology. Amy is an economist who has an extensive background in financial services and trading in Budapest to sell off London and Rome. She's working with various startups and engaged in digital assets and blockchain technology. She co-founded Women in Blockchain in Switzerland in 2018 and in mentor and expert at the CV Labs incubation program in blockchain's pre-acceleration of Latvia. We mostly invited you because we almost don't know anything about blockchain. <laughs> and so we would be really happy if you could start with a small explanation. I hand over to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, Emily, for the introduction. Um, so either we can go and jump directly into um, the, the, the blockchain, um, let's say, um, intro. However, it's important that you exactly understand that, of course, the technology offers a, a wide array of, of applications and we want to make sure that you get the most out of it. So please just uh, also given the time then just uh, interfere, ask questions or, or, or that we can get to, to, the, um, to the point where it gets also interesting for you uh, once you have the general understanding uh, what it could also mean um for you know the real estate business for architects and and and, and also in terms of of value um maybe quickly why why us so it's it's fun so the i, I actually started off in traditional banking and at some point i realized i realized that it, the world is really shifting paradigm so we are at the at the very pivotal point where a lot will or is about to change and and this is really important to understand uh, it's not only the financial industry or the financial sector it's 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 way broader and uh, i'm i think or i'm under the belief that there is really a, a shift happening also that the whole let's say socio uh, economic complex sociological changes will will happen and and one of the main drivers is technology and now the now the thing about uh, Amy, it's it's actually really um, interesting. Also, the the position Switzerland holds uh, in re with regards to this transformation, this digital transformation, as you can say, and and Switzerland is at the forefront still in terms of driving this. There's also a lot of support from the um, politicians and and also the federal council. Uh, now we also had just uh, some laws being passed, but I don't go into all the details here. But but still, the fun the fun thing is there is a lot of talent coming to Switzerland. You most likely already heard of the Crypto Valley in Zug. This is no, now no longer only in Zug, but also Zurich and here in Geneva and this region. There are a lot of projects, major projects from all over the world. So um, a lot of the buzz and a lot of the activity is happening in, in, in Switzerland. And this also brings um, a lot of talent. And one of the talent is of course, Amy. And, and it's also interesting to know um, or that we met actually at the, at the WEF, uh, at the side event uh, on blockchain. And, and it compared to traditional finance, um, it's, it's, it's really, as you said before, it's really a family. So there is, um, a lot of people, uh, not a lot of people started off with it, but everybody knows 
each other and and and, and there's a lot of energy good energy to 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 shape something and build something uh, and with that maybe i can quickly hand over to you yeah. thanks lucas and thanks for the compliment um it's uh, it's definitely an honor to be here and talk to you guys and girls about uh, about blockchain and cryptocurrencies and and why are we actually in this industry so maybe just briefly to my background, what, uh, what was not included in uh, the intro of Emily. So I always worked for, um, for banks or asset managers, um, did a bit of uh, interval in training or trading, sorry, oil trading, commodity trading in London. And then I moved to Switzerland in 2016, worked for Credit Suisse. And all the developers I worked with uh, were talking about uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in the lunch breaks. And I think everyone, or, or not everyone, but many people get into this um, field because they think first that, oh, uh, I'm going to invest in something what will have potentially high return in a very short time. And um, of course, this is, a, this is a beautiful value add and it gives you the traction to try out uh, this alternative methods of payment, but we are trying in this call to, to give you an insight beyond the quick gain in returns. And um, maybe to, to say that uh, at the beginning, there was also like the, the notion about Bitcoin, then later about blockchain, and now it's about security tokens. And uh, what we need in order to evolve as, as an industry is security. And uh, the company I work for is Ledger and, and they are establishing that. Uh, basically not only security of crypto and various digital assets, but also IoT. And, and this ties a bit into architecture because the future of smart cities are going to be um, built on IoT or as in every um, aspect of a smart city is going to be connected through a secure channel. And these devices and, and, and the lamps are going to communicate with the road, for instance. And it's important that, that the way they communicate and interact is through a secure channel. So let's not pivot too far away from, from blockchain, but, but yeah, uh, just want to highlight the security and, uh, and maybe you heard about various hacks um, like exchanges were hacked or, or um, other um, crypto players like asset managers. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, as a whole to evolve, security is very important. Um, maybe you also heard of the Crypto Valley Association, just to say a word or two. Uh, it's an association which was founded in uh, TUG. And uh, if you're interested in cryptocurrencies and blockchain, you're welcome to join and, and learn and be part of a working group. We already have over 7,000 members today and a lot of um, energetic and, and young uh, people are part of it. Perfect. So with that, I think we go quickly into um, the, the introduction. Can you, can you maybe share the Yeah, so um, we thought that it's useful if Lucas is giving you an overview about um, what Oh. oh, okay. What uh, blockchain is, and uh, Lucas has a few slides to that. Maybe I'm going to try share. to share my screen, but I don't think I have sharing rights. Are you with the with the web on the web uh, version of Zoom? If not, no, actually no, I think not. It, maybe it works. Yeah. yeah. Um, you should have. You're the co-host, so you should have, you should be able to share your screen. Okay, I think it's working now. One second. It's working. We can see your screen. Okay. I wonder where is the which is the presentation? I think it's this one. So. Can you guys see the screen well? Yes. Isn't it blurry? It's loading, just a second. No, it's yeah. good. 
Okay, good. So, I mean, Amy already gave some hints about uh, security, but also there's um, um, a lot of other um, factors to it. And, and, and this is one of the most important, let's say, um, things about this technology is, is of course trust. And now I'm, um, you know, I'm letting you ask yourself, for example, when you think about money and when you think about how you interact with one another, what is one of the most important things? It's, it's, it's trust. So you can, you, you can trust the other person that, for example, if you give something and you expect something in return, this transaction is, is trusted or the counterparty um, is trusted. So um, you, you also place the same actually into, in, into our institutions or into a bank. You, you place trust in them. So you expect when you give them your salary that they store it for you and that at any point in time you can actually retrieve the cash um, which belongs to you, but they you entrust them with um, storing it and managing it, right? So in, in terms to, and this is very like more like um, an analogy I wanted to give you to understand a little the concept um, about this technology, um, I, I wanted to present you the, the Merchant of Venice. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a known Shakespeare um, piece. Um, however, I just now take this persona and, and, and want to explain you quickly what in that sense a distributed ledger exactly means, which is basically a major part of the blockchain technology. So what you can see here is, is a ledger. This is the ledger of um, the merchant we have seen before. Um, so we go back into uh, Renaissance Venice with all the merchants with the nice dresses. And now picture one guy, it's, it's this guy sitting at the harbor and he actually holds a ledger about everything is which comes in and goes out from the harbor, every transaction is recorded on that very ledger, as you can see here on that picture. Now, what could be what could be the risk here? Is apparently, um, of course, there are many risks. For example, if this guy, uh, you know, makes a typo or things like that, but the major risk is also that this guy could be corrupt. Um, he could, for example, overnight just change the numbers or, or change, change the names. So that, for example, not um, Amy owes to Lucas uh, a thousand um, shilling or lira or whatever, uh, but for example, the other way around. And then when you picture this ledger being, let's say, um, a proof, then you, you, you find it difficult to prove otherwise. So if this ledger is actually proof, proving who owes what to whom, then you are totally dependent on this guy. And now coming back to what distributed ledger means is actually that, for example, let's, let's picture the left side of this, of this book, of this ledger. Here, the, 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 the merchant actually adds every transaction occurring in one day. And now imagine that in the end of the day, he actually copies this page and gives it to all um, the people in Venice. So this is the concept of a distribution of the ledger. So it's now a distributed ledger. So if he overnight forges or changes anything, all the other guys can come back and say, hey, I have a copy and on my copy it states that it's I, am, I owe 1000 to Amy and not the other way around. And then we could prove that he actually forged something. Um, this is the concept of the distributed ledger in that sense. However, um, it is difficult at this point in time um, to do this or back in Venice times to do this 
in a, in a let's say, in an operational, feasible manner. Now, with the technology we have at hand, this has become possible. So you could compare this to, I don't know who is familiar with file sharing, um, BitTorrent, for example. This is a, a, a similar concept where you actually um, distribute uh, content or a file or data among many, many, many servers or people. So all of these people hold a, a part or the entire uh, document or for example, this presentation. So with that, it's difficult or almost impossible to destroy it. And this is the second thing which is important here. You cannot destroy it. Um, so even though if you murder the merchant uh, like him and burn his book, the data is out and 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 it's 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 or, or let's say it's almost difficult uh, to to get this data um, deleted. So now you understand the concept of this this distribution of a ledger, and now you may ask yourself, okay, why is it called blockchain? So this is why I was relating first to the left page picture now the right page. So this would be a day after the last um, the left page was written. And now the day after the guy comes back and he starts writing. So every page is a block and on a block, given a certain period of time, all the entries are being made, uh, which occurred or all the transactions which occurred in that time interval are being noted and registered on that ledger. As soon as the time interval was finished, this page is being distributed among all the, let's say citizens in the city of uh, Venice. But now there is something coming onto it because it could also be that somebody just lies and, and says, okay, I now bought the ship for a thousand shilling um, and, 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 and puts it here. So what we also need is some guys, they validate the accuracy of this page or of this ledger. These um, authenticators on the blockchain mostly are referred to miners. You maybe heard of these guys like the miners are the guys they made a lot of money by validating the blocks and validate, validating the blocks in let's say in renaissance times would have been that you take an abacus you know this uh, calculus uh, mechanism this beautiful thing where you take an abacus and then you go through the ledger and then you start off with all the balances the, the good people of, <laughs> of Venice had before the transactions, like the journal you see on the, on the left-hand side um, were recorded. And then you calculate what comes out of it. So it's really accounting. And then in the end, you can say, all these transactions are legit. And the authenticator in Venice who actually came out with, with the correct result the fastest, he gets a reward for doing so. So he gets, let's say, some, some sort of salary for validating this page. In the modern times, we don't do this with actually uh, going through all these kind of um, transactions manually, but we do it in a far more sophisticated way. So what happens is we use computing power to solve a mathematical um, problem. And with the computing power, once the mathematical problem was solved, you get a reward for it. And by solving the problem, you authenticate all the legit transactions and all the illegit transactions on the block. And once you have the solution, you tell the full network, hey, I found the solution, transaction A, B, C, and F, and Z, 
are valid and all the others are not, for example. And with that, you avoid wrong, false, or forged transactions. So this is, in, in, in short, this is the concept. Uh, what we also see here in a, let's say, in, a, in an example of the modern times, um, you actually see that A wants to send money to B. So let's say Amy wants to send it to me. And the transaction request is being sent out to all the, all the participants of the network. So everybody now sees, um, once it's written on, the, on this kind of ledger, everybody sees, okay, there's a transaction happening from A to B. And now what happens is exactly as said before, these validators or now these miners, they validate the transaction. And once it's ledgered and validated, they then add this block as valid to the blockchain. So with that, you see, first thing is the validators get a reward for it. So this is called this mining reward. And with that, also the supply of the money increases over time. What happens also is the page, as we see, have seen before, which I refer now to a block, um, is being added to the blockchain. But what this also means is that you never ever can go back in time. Because with the book you've seen before, you can go, you can go back a few pages and change something. Here, this is no longer possible because everybody has a, has a copy with a timestamp of the block. So you can only change things in the future by adding a new block, for example, which states, hey, we did a, a, a transaction the wrong way. Now I want to transact back, but you cannot go back and, and, and change the, the, the transactions. So this is important to understand for use cases we want to talk later about. Only after the block was validated and approved by the network, only then the transaction is really being executed and valid and then being moved from A to B. What is also important to know for you is that most protocols are public so everybody sees this kind of um, blocks or, or ledgers. So when I know her address on the blockchain or, or her, let's say, wallet, I can look up and see, OK, she just received a thousand whatever, <laughs> for digital francs, Bitcoin, and the like. And we, we then see for a very specific point in time that my, let's say my, that the ownership of my money changed to her. And this is important to, to keep in mind for the later discussion. Um, I think if you have questions right now, then please uh, ask us, but quickly, I just want to, to already make an outlook what we want to talk about. Also, of course, considering the questions you may have and you have prepared, but in terms of applications and, and, and what kind of concepts came to our mind where we were also discussing with, uh, with Barbara in preparations um, are like these, these four uh, concepts and institutions. So one of which being payments. So this is one of the most common and, and most, let's say, progressed uh, applications of the blockchain. Then we will talk quickly about privacy. So this is Amy's topic in particular. Later on, and this is important for you as well, uh, as architects, we will um, have a, a, a dive into ownership and, and then it gets somewhat, um, let's say, interesting also in terms of, let's say, politics or philosophical questions. It's about decentralization. So with that, um, please feel free to ask any questions about um, the concept of the blockchain.
Thank you so much for this uh, really clear presentation. I don't know if you want to start with some question or if you want to go a little bit further. Um, uh, yes, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, those four topics that you just presented that you would um, like to talk about, um, in some sense, those uh, topics are also represented in the questions that we uh, prepared for you. So if you like, we can also just um, jump straight into the questions and then just get to those topics as we go along. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I'm just really curious to know that uh, that who has Bitcoin or, at the, uh, or any other cryptocurrency from, from uh, the audience. So like, have you ever tried uh, to transact with Bitcoin or hands up? No one? No one. Okay, so we can, we can change that um, like now. And I'm happy to, I just checked and in, in one of my um, wallets, I have um, some Bitcoin to give away. Like let's say five dollars of Bitcoin. If uh, if someone can tell me that, um, so one aspect of Bitcoin is that it's uh, finite. So it's not that I can print as many uh, as uh, as I want, and I can inject it into the economy from one day to another. And um, maybe you guys heard of Satoshi Nakamoto as well. But my question to you is, and the first person who is going to shout this out is, is, is going to get the five dollars worth of Bitcoin or five Swiss francs worth of Bitcoin. And the question is, how many Bitcoins can be mined? You can also quickly Google. It's just who is the quickest. <laughs> um, 21 million. Yeah, okay. Oh. Hi. What's your name? <laughs> um, I'm Olga. Oh. Olga, nice to meet you. So maybe best is if you if you create a Bitcoin wallet, which is uh, just it, it takes a matter of minutes or your, you can be even uh, quicker and do that. And uh, just send me your Bitcoin address, which is a string of characters between 26 and 35 characters. Send me your public address, not your private key. And once I have that public address, I will send you the um, five uh, Swiss francs worth of Bitcoin. And congratulations on, on being the first. Uh, it's actually really interesting that you um, would talk about this right now uh, and also about the way you started to introduce the topic is actually the same way that we wanted to start the talk uh, specifically about this topic of trust and this idea that um, uh, right now we live in this world where we, in order to have a, a transaction between two people or true two entities, there is always this sort of uh, mediating um, uh, uh, entity in the middle, this mediating um, institution. Um, so blockchain, as we as we understood, it holds this sort of potential to eliminate this, this intermediary. Um, however, our question to you would be, um, where do you see in this in this kind of very peer to peer system that blockchain offers where institutions seem almost unnecessary? Is there is there still a role for banks? I mean, you you work for a, for a digital asset bank in a way. Is there still a role for institutions like banks or government agencies? Are they still needed? Then? That's a very good question. So, I mean, basically going back in the history of why or what triggered the the emergence of the technology was actually the the the, the Lehman Brothers and the financial crisis and this kind of. Um, implosion of, of, of trust. So nobody actually trusted, or in particular the guys, they came up in the financial system. And in particular also with, um, uh, let's say, central banks and how the whole system works in, in supply of money and, and the like. And Amy also mentioned the name. So it's a guy or maybe it's a group of guys or, or girls or whomever. It's called Satoshi Nakamoto. And this was actually over 10 years ago now, this was a white paper where this technology was, was actually uh, um, being put on paper. Um, before, there were also other uh, ideas about this, 
these guys, they call themselves cyberpunks and, and they just wanted to change the world and the, the financial system and, and the full architecture because everything is, is intertwined in terms of this complex of in, in the world we actually live in right now. Coming back to banks and, and let's say central authorities or intermediaries, of course, this is certainly not, or in, 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 to a certain extent, it's not in the sense of the inventor or in the idea of the inventor to have, um, a, let's say, a, a central authority or an intermediary for transacting, because as you rightly put, it should be peer to peer. Um, however, what we see, um, and this is also the reason why the market and, and the applications and also the, let's say, the, the big money did not go into the technology for a long time because it was not regulated. Um, there was a lot of shady stuff happening there as well. So it also comes back to actually another topic again, and this is trust um, in that sense that a lot of people, they did not trust the technology because it was co-noted with a lot of distrustful and illicit activities. And this is why, um, this is one of the, of the things, what we want to do and achieve is also primarily also targeting in an institutional money and, and, and we want to, to build, um, an infrastructure which is actually trusted and secure as, for example, a traditional bank account, where you say, okay, we have, we have let's say, one of the most secure technologies in place. Um, we have one of the best uh, in terms of um, setups or hard, um, hardened systems in terms of um, being compliant and, 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 and this, you cannot do if you transact only peer to peer because then you need to know okay who is the other guy um, is where does he has it, his money from um, I mean this makes it difficult if you don't know what's happening on the other side this is why but for for certain cases it makes sense to have to have a trusted and regulated institution which helps you. To, to store, to transfer, to trade, um, but also, and there it gets also, again, interesting to, to provide technology to, to use, um, to use or, or to profit from, the, from this kind of new ways of transacting or, and we will get there in a minute also to, to have a possibility to, to digitalize assets or to find liquidity to, to um, um, then have a market for these kinds of assets. Because if anything, everything is just, um, if there are no big regulated providers in the market, the market will remain most likely too small and too illiquid. And with that, it will not grow and it will not conquer the world. So this is why it uses um, the trust providers because it fosters trust. Yeah. So you would, and therefore you would say um, the blockchain in and of itself is not enough to, because when you read about blockchain, oftentimes it's maybe very optimistically hailed as this sort of inherently trustworthy system that, that kind of has the possibility to get rid of those, of the need to trust in the system. I mean, you yourself talked about this idea that uh, back in Venice, you would have to trust in, in, in the banker, for instance. The way you describe it now, it sounds to me like if blockchain isn't that radically different from what we have right now, no? Because I still need to have this trusted intermediary in the bank, even though blockchain sort of has this potential of having this built in already. Isn't that kind of a, um, a kind of a wasted potential in a sense? Or is that not even there, the potential in the first place? That's just too, too optimistic thinking. No, the, the potential is definitely there. And there's right now, this, there's a huge boom in terms of decentralized finance happening. So 
you have, let's say, counterpartyless um, liquidity pool. So it's not, not an exchange which is managed by somebody, but it's only algorithms matching orders. And these kind of things, it's already there and happening. Uh, our take is not, it's, it's not about um, blocking these kind of evolvements, but make it, make it secure and compliant and, and also building, let's say, more like a technological platform, um, which includes and, and adds these kind of offerings, but only the ones who commit to certain standards. Um, another, let's say, let, another thing to it is, um, for example, Olga, if she now opens a, a wallet address and she does it on, let's say, Bitcoin address or bitcoinwallet.org, and she can just hover around and then it generates uh, her wallet. And then she can print it out. And on there, she has the public key and the private key. Picture the public key as your letterbox and your private key is the key to open it. And uh, this is exactly how, for example, Bitcoin or other public uh, networks operate. So you have a, a letterbox with where you can stick the money in it and you have a private key to actually transact so you can take the money out. The interesting part, this is just a side note, the letterbox is, is actually, um, what is it? You can see through it. So it, everybody who walks by sees what's in that letterbox. Um, this is with a public network, you see that. Um, now, why do you need, for example, a bank? It already starts here. So we, for example, manage also private keys. So, I mean, Ledger does that as well uh, in a, let's say, in another fashion. We do it for you. Ledger lets it do you for yourself. Uh, so we host keys. They let you self-host them or uh, store them. Um, but the idea behind it is that your money is safe, right? It's, if, if you just keep this a piece of paper with a private key on it and somebody steals it from you or you lose it then your bitcoin are lost forever there's no way you can get them back and this happened a lot of times so i think how many three to five percent of all the bitcoins are are no longer accessible because the private keys uh, they went lost and yeah this, this could also happen to olga but if she opens an account with us um, i mean then we manage her bank account as as you know it from a traditional world so if something happens to her or, or she needs to get access um, we can do this for her and we can keep it also in terms of attacks um, for example what also can happen is of course if if we know olga now has 20 million on her address and she has not you know 20 million and five now Million. Exactly. Plus the, Plus the five francs. <laughs> and uh, so, she, she did not come up with a very sophisticated way of, you know, secure uh, and, and store and maybe also keep maybe the funds a little more separate than just of, on one address. It could be that somebody at some point realizes it and then just take her hostage and extort the private key. And then, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to it also in terms of personal security and security of your private keys. Maybe just two points to add here. So yeah, a lot of people think that, oh my God, crypto is so complicated. I want to be exposed to this asset class, but I don't trust myself with this new type of technology. So that's why they, they want a third party like Signum Bank to manage their funds and, and store it in the most secure way. Or if you're, you're someone who's tax savvy and is okay with, with managing uh, your crypto assets, then you're really going with the notion of, of, of cryptocurrencies that you, know, you are really the ultimate responsible for these assets. And we have this saying in, in, in um, the industry that not your keys, not your crypto, because if I'm um, outsourcing my trust to Signum Bank, then um, how do I know if, if in, in 20 years they will be around? So uh, that's, that's one point that, yeah, the tech savvy people are happy to do it the, the, themselves, the not tech savvy seek for a third party. And then these are called the custodians of the keys because 
yeah, they hold the ultimate uh, private keys and, and they have the ability to sign transactions. And then the other aspect is that there may be some regulatory requirements in some jurisdictions that you cannot hold more than 100 million uh, by yourself. Um, and then you asked about banks. So a lot of banks are, uh, central banks are thinking of issuing their own digital currency. And then we would think, okay, Okay, but the digital dollar, like the dollar is digital or the Swiss franc is digital. But if we transact or if, if we really create these digital francs issued by the central bank, I can send you a digital Swiss franc without leaving out the commercial banks. So um, we don't know if, if, if this digital Swiss franc is really going to happen. And then maybe you all heard of Libra, which is, um, it's not a cryptocurrency what they are building because it's centralized and cryptocurrency cannot be functioning um, as, a, the, the, like as, as the product of a for-profit company, which ultimately has the power over deciding on governance and other various aspects. And this question got like the answer got super long. So sorry about that. Maybe we can go to the next question. Yeah, just maybe to, to fi finalize because there's a lot of interesting uh, topics coming, you know, um, th th these questions are, is concerned to. Uh, one, one thing is also somebody needs to do the work, all, all the work in terms of, okay, what can you actually do with this kind of funds to be, you know, not, um, evading taxes, it's about regulatory, you know, different regulatory frameworks on different jurisdictions. Um, it's about also that we make sure that the funds which are on this bank are not related to any uh, money laundering or terrorist finance and all these kind of things. So once your funds are onboarded with a regulated bank, you can also really dispose of these kind of funds. So you can, if you have 20, and five, uh, 20 million and five francs in crypto, um, you can actually go to a traditional bank, you can sell it and buy from some Swiss francs, or you can buy a car with it. I mean, then you are in the, in the then you can really use it as a means of payment also. And this is right now, it's not possible for many uh, providers uh, in the market because simply, for example, all the traditional banks, they have, you know, they don't have the framework, the understanding, and also they at some point also don't want to take the risk to onboard all these kind of funds because, yeah, it, 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 it used to be Wild West. So there was a lot of business being made in an unregulated uh, manner. And just picture, for example, there are a lot of you know, also sanctions and, 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 and this is why you, don't, you also have this kind of central banks. So they, they clear transactions and they shield off, for example, funds or have capital controls and all these things. Uh, and you can, of course, discuss how political money should be, but right now the world is as it is in, in, with that regard. Um, but just picture, for example, you have capital controls in the country and, and, and they, they, they don't want to have too much evasion of, of, of assets um, that they don't dry out and all the wealth is being shifted. And then you have crypto where you can peer to peer push, push a button and just move all your funds out. And this is actually possible with the technology, but of course it needs to be, still it needs to be regulated. So if you are a rightful owner and you did not, nothing wrong or, don't have anything to hide, um, then of course you should be able to, to dispose and process and own these kind of funds and, and, and use it as you see fit. But if not, if you are actually in violation or of the law or if you financing uh, terrorism and all these kind of things, which could be possible if it's not regulated, then of course it also makes sense to, to have some means and, and, and processes in place to avoid this. So this is also what a regulated player does. It makes the, it makes it, let's say the, the, 
the coins in the market more white and cleaner. Uh, thank you very much for the answer. Here is Olga again. And <laughs> I have a next question um, because you mentioned transparency, which is also one important point of blockchain. And you want also to make a step further from cryptocurrency to other fields in which the blockchain um, technology may be used. Um, and a couple of days ago, we were talking about um, making processes in food production more visible to allow co consumers to make more informed decisions on what they are buying, for instance. And we were wondering, um, can blockchain bring about a positive shift concerning transparency in both business and politics? Absolutely. So there are so many exciting projects uh, which are uh, addressing the area of supply chain. And uh, you were talking about uh, food supply, but, but the first one which comes to my mind is a company called, called Everledger, which is uh, tracing diamonds through the blockchain. So when you're buying a, or, or, or get a beautiful diamond, then then you would love to know if is that is that a, a blood diamond or is it a lab diamond and and so you can use um, Everledger's blockchain in order to to get this single source of truth or get access to to this uh, source of truth um, where where that uh, diamond is coming from uh, or there is another project Mind Spider which is um, which is like sourcing all the minerals or as in gives information on various minerals, uh, which uh, various uh, big corporations are using. Um, so Everledger is using Hyperledger, that's um, um, an enterprise blockchain. And an enterprise blockchain is basically not an open network. So not everyone can access uh, it. It's, it's, it's a closed uh, network. and. Um, is there something that you want to add? No, no. I thought. Uh, so um, basically, absolutely, these blockchains can can help governments uh, in order to get relevant information. Absolutely. I mean, there are, as you said, there are a, a very, very many possible applications in terms also of supply chain. Um, one thing is really important also to understand not every application per se is, is a business case. Uh, this is one thing, not always blockchain ultimately means that you can make money off it or that, that it makes sense because blockchain is still, it's also, in, it's also expensive. So every, you know, every entry or every transaction, it costs money. Um, so a lot of or many things you can also solve in traditional databases. However, of course, in terms of exactly this immutability and, and, and the, the, the blockchain network, um, which is distributed, of course, you have another um, sort of um, exactly where the source of truth lies. However, it's, it's really important to challenge all these kind of um, uh, business cases first before you jump on it. Because there's also a second thing. You can use blockchain, you can also use a database. What is important, it is the root where the data comes from. So even if you have a super fair uh, supply chain um, anal analysis, and you see, for example, that uh, your um, cacao beans have been um, produced in uh, at the farm in Ecuador, uh, which adheres to highest standards uh, and you have fair trade and everything in place, um, you can never be sure because some, some guy needs to put the data on the blockchain. So somebody needs to tell you, okay, these five kilo of, uh, of beans, they actually were produced at day X and they then went for shipping and, and it's, it's still the same beans which you find now in uh, your, your, let's say, in your Migo. Um, but it could also be that the guy who puts this data and, and, and actually puts it on the blockchain or, or adds a, a, tack, a, a tracker in the first place could also be corrupt. So there's, this is actually the weak spot. It, it still needs to, the real world 
still needs to be linked at some point. And later on, it can be tracked and traced. For example, there's also, for example, uh, watches, luxury items. There was just, uh, I think, Breitling, they announced they have now watches where um, they have serial number and it's recorded on a blockchain as well. So you can picture any kind of these um, applications where ownership changes or we, where we have a strong case for uh, supply chain management. And this could also go into um, shipping. Um, I mean, I wanted to get into that with exactly the explanation also of smart contracts, what, what that means. So this is a further application, which is being put on top of the traditional just transaction A to B, B to C. So it's, it's a, a piece of code, which could mean that as long as A holds um, property of C, then A is entitled, for example, to receive uh, a dividend. And then this is being put also, this kind of piece of code is being put as well on the blockchain. And then it's like a, a software, like a rule, which then applies. Um, and this could mean, for example, as long as Amy holds um, property A, let's say she holds it for three minutes, she then is entitled to receive three minutes of dividend of that uh, piece of property. Or it could mean the other way around that she, for example, financed 10 sea miles of the transport of the cargo, for example, of said uh, uh, cocoa beans. Yeah. Uh, and she then gets a revenue for taking the risk and, and financing this, for example, uh, fair trade um, uh, transaction. So this is also a further application which opens the door to a lot of a lot of things and uh, maybe in the end we quickly can then get into uh, what it could mean also for 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 you as architects or where, where there are some interesting concepts coming to it. Um, thank you I actually have a follow-up question to this kind of um, idea of transparency and making processes transparent. A couple of weeks ago, we had a talk from uh, Nico Müller from Würstum Partner. Um, and he said that, uh, for instance, a big part of the real estate market isn't interested in greater transparency or in introducing this greater transparency because it will impact profits. Um, so how do you react to this um, when you have industries that maybe do not actually want to be transparent, maybe looking at the real estate market? Yeah, I mean, in general, this is exactly what holds off the, the revolution. So Amy was mentioning diamond trade. You can go further, art, art dealers, for example, uh, auction houses, um, all these kind of things, vintage cars, uh, which have a very, let's say, intransparent market to it, there a, a handful, a handful of very, um, let's say, powerful players in these kind of markets, they hold more or less monopolies. They do, of course, a lot to combat this technical uh, involvement. And as they have a very high market share and they don't adapt, they want to keep the market as, as it is for now because they might lose, of course, um, their, their market share with it. And with transparency, transparency also, it comes to light that this kind of intermediary business, they take exorbitant margins. And as you um, put it rightly, um, with the technology at hand, this will at some point be, it, it's called in, in a digital transformation term, it's called, they will be disintermediated. So at some point there's, for some of the transactions, there's no use anymore for intermediaries because you can match uh, like, like um, what is it? Uh, supply and demand automatically or, or in this kind of with a small contract as explained before. But still, I just want, always also to add the other side of the coin, still a lot of, in particular, of these kind of 
very valuable items and, and tickets. A lot is also about personal relationship and, and, and trusting and, 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 and having, a, let's say, a counterparty, really. Um, so I think also in the art markets, people just still trust more into a person they knew for a long time now and made business with him than just to, let's say, um, a bunch of numbers. Um, so it's, it's twofold, but, but I would say the incumbents, how you can call them, uh, they of course have not a lot of interest to, to invest too, too, fierce, too fiercely into that technology and also real estate owners, I guess, because right now this is also very, and maybe for sure you know more about this, but this is also a very elite circle of a few very large um, property holders, right? And they have their partners and they have their terms. And, 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 and if it's get, getting too transparent, then um, it becomes apparent also how they do business or how much margin is in between. And, and the end customer or the client then sees maybe that the, 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 the bill he receives in the end is inflated. Uh, given this obstacle um, that we just talked about, uh, especially in the housing market, where do you actually see the potential for blockchain in, uh, in housing, in architecture? So um, I believe that it's, uh, it's amazing that you can buy a fraction of, uh, of a 10 or 100 billion office building. So we see a world, and I think we, we agree on this with Lucas. There's not everything we agree on when it comes to, to blockchain and cryptocurrencies, but on this one, we surely agree that in the future, um, a lot of things like, like big buildings are going to be tokenized or uh, art is going to be tokenized. And of course, alone, you would never be able to, to uh, own that property, but you can buy a part of it just as if you invested in, in, a, in a fund uh, which is um, representing um, shares or gives you a package where you can be exposed to, um, to real estate. Now, um, beyond that, um, like other use cases for, for housing, do you have any other um, yeah. example? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it, it goes uh, into, a direction also, and this is, let's say, the, the uh, a little the utopian uh, end state, but maybe we can get to that later on. But it's about um, making property far more, let's say, efficient and more, far more um, getting more out of it. So, I mean, the most important thing, Amy, you already mentioned that that you can crowdfund, for example, projects because right now the administrate administrative burden was just too high to fraction a house into a million pieces for example uh, in Chile or Peru I think it was they built a skyscraper with that you know um, fractioning of property um, so you could actually go in and maybe think of a completely crazy ambitious type of real estate project and crowdfund it so you don't need to have a big player per se who supports it and have the, has the market power, you know, because right now it's only the big guys uh, getting to the big uh, prime real estate um, site and projects, uh, at least to my understanding. So this can change, for example. So you can enable actually and democratize this kind of, uh, or change the access to, to this kind of ownership and for example, we as a group could now come together and, and think of a project which we crowdfund and, 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 and build something nice of it. And you, uh, as the architects, draw a, a very um, innovative, for example, concept for housing. And we can then um, look how we can finance it. But it, there's even more to it. Uh, I mean, with this kind of smart contracts, you could basically 
digitalize every aspect of the house. You could say, okay, I want to rent half of the room for three days. Or you could say, I want to sell off the negative emissions, the house bears, um, to another guy who then resells it. Or you could say, um, I want to um, make, and you can already do so, but in an easier fashion, you could then also um, sell electricity, which you produce uh, via smart contracts. I mean, all these kind of things, you can build a, like a like a business model out of just some rooms, which right now you just pay the rent and bear the cost. And and with this new technology, you could think of you can also cultivate gardens, for example, in, uh, like like vertical gardens, and and let somebody else own it and and and, and harvest it and maintain it, and or or let a group of people do that or or sell it off. I mean, it's just, it requires some, some crazy thoughts, but basically all this is possible. Maybe just uh, to highlight the censorship resistance uh, aspect um, is, is that if I'm, a, if I'm an Iranian star architect and I only um, have clients in Iran, but someone is, uh, someone from the US says that listen, Emmy, like I really want you to design my new home. And uh, they have no other means of, 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 of paying me than to their bank account. I mean, that's not possible because, uh, because um, you can't initiate a transfer to a bank from the US to Iran because of uh, sanctions. And there are other ways, right, to, to pay me and that could be my preferred way would be Bitcoin because I don't need approval from anyone and there are no sanctions or there's no government uh, behind. Okay. I'd like to, I'd like to ask something. Um, I mean, I can see how the idea of blockchain has the potential to be empowering and even emancipatory, but all of the examples that you give are actually, I mean, you both come from a banking and asset management background. Um, and the other people I've met who are involved in blockchain also come from banking backgrounds. And actually most of the week, this is the last day that we're having guests uh, talking to us this week, have been actually about challenging the kind of status quo of everything being monetized that, uh, you know, from my point of view and the work that we're doing in the studio this semester, the biggest problem with real estate is that real estate has made land and property into an asset class. And that's been hugely distorting. And it's meant that rather than homes being a right, homes become a privilege. Um, and I can see how the structure of the blockchain can be emancipatory, but many of the examples that you're giving are really you know, it's, it's, like, it's like the last hurrah of capitalism. You know, it's clear the problems with conventional financial institutions. I mean, they're, they're almost infinite, the problems with those institutions. And also, you know, when you were talking about having your money in a bank, like other than a kind of a convenience, and it isn't even that convenient, I wonder why I have my money in my bank because they don't do anything for me. And a British bank is even worse than a Swiss bank because in a British bank, even to move the money around in Britain, you pay money to the bank, it's crazy. So I agree with you about all of the criticism of conventional financial institutions, but it is true that a lot of people doing work on blockchain, it is, it is about adding value in new ways to transactions, isn't it? I mean, even the crowdfunding example, it's true what you said that you could have an idea about setting up a Genossenschaft and rather than needing to go to, you know, the city of Zurich and various other people, you could crowdfund it, it's true. I don't know how people would know that you're bona fide and you could actually deliver on the project afterwards. But I could see how that, that would work. Um, but you're also in a very honest way saying how 
all of the distortions and the explicit or maybe implicit dishonesty that happens in conventional financial industry, that workings in, with cryptocurrencies, they're also liable to that. It's also only as good as how honest, you know, the person uh, confirming the validity of the blockchain is. And I'd, I'd really be interested to hear you talk about, and it's not about a systemic change. It's not about being for or against capitalism, really, because in a way, I don't know if that's relevant at the moment, but how could blockchain in a kind of very direct and understandable way um, work in ways that are not just about monetizing things, you know, not just about discovering new asset classes? That's a, I mean, that's a very... Uh, interesting question, of course. I mean, on, let's say on, on, a, on one of level, of course, I mean, if you're working in a startup and you see all these projects, of course, they need to eventually make money. This is why, of course, still in the, in the uh, you, you, you have this pressure because otherwise, even if you do good, but you don't, you cannot finance the people working for it. Uh, and you can also do not find a way to pay like this kind of transaction fees and all the like. So you, um, then of course, there's all, all, all the efforts you put into it are then, you know, don't you know, add, change anything. But for example, with the housing, you can also think that the technology can make housing and how we use space more and more efficient. And we, it could also, um, actually reduce the space we use uh, because people learn to live with less or if they're, you know, maybe don't even no longer need to live at the same place for 10 years, but they live where they are. And another person then, um, you know, directly in a really more efficient way, the room which is dense already and densely used um, can then use the, the room more, exactly more, more, more efficient. Uh, you can produce even things with room. And I know this sounds capitalistic, but as said, the end game would rather be that, and this is just a belief I bear because I think it's just interesting going back into the Greek world where you had really this kind of police, um, police, so not the police, uh, so it's about having smaller societies or groups, which maybe even share the same beliefs and have um, same institutions in which they, uh, you know, it's, it's more like, li li let's say liberal understanding, but that you can actually choose the kind of society you want to live in and the society and all the governing is actually um, managed and governed with the blockchain so it's a piece of you know a carta to which everybody adhere to and all the way of interaction is, is actually um, transacted via this carta so you have a perfectly fine rule of law you don't have any kind of you know um, risk or, or a, a reduced risk um, of of bribery, of, of, of intransparency. So everybody opting for that kind of um, society and institutions he believes in gets exactly what he, he opts for and, and, and chooses for. And, and then also he meets the like-minded people which or who, um, who made a conscious decision to live in this kind of um, let's say contract or this kind of society are there another, on the person goes to another like small society and this is this is one point and just the other one is also it becomes more and more possible to decentralize also societies because technology um, enables with let's say decentralized production of electricity like smart grids you have decentralized maybe also production of of of, of food so more and more, it could become possible that you can form these kind of groups sharing the same belief system. 
And this, I think, quite interesting. And if you then have these kind of contracts, which are immutable and counterpartyless, but which are just there and written in code, uh, so everybody knows what's happening. But is anyone doing work in that area? Because, for instance, two days ago, uh, we heard about this concept of permaculture, you know, which is a response to the environmental crisis, but it's also a response to various breakdowns in social structures. And it's really trying to bring together in quite a realistic way, actually, um, a number of challenges that exist in society. And what you were describing, I could imagine going along when, when these, they're very experimental, when these experimental communities wanted to, when there were more of them, perhaps, and they needed to think about the equivalent of financing, because, you know, I could imagine maybe they want to avoid anything that's too close to conventional forms of financing. I could imagine what you're describing might provide a model, but are there people in the social sciences, for instance, looking at blockchain as an analogy? You know, because I can see what you're saying, although I can also say it's a bit naive what you're saying uh, politically. Um, but I can also see that at the root of it, there is something. Um, but it's very abstract at the moment. You know, the, the area that blockchain isn't abstract is this idea of making transactions and people making money on the transactions. That's concrete. And the security. Okay, so I would love to bring in two points here. So there are so many, like, so-called blockchain for good projects. And uh, I invite you to check out this website, b4h.world. So this is actually blockchain for humanity, b4h.world. Happy to also throw into, into here later, but um, into the chat. But basically, uh, an example of what the Swiss based company is, is working on a use case. Um, Procevis is the name of the company. And for the Rohingyas, I don't know if you guys know which community is the Rohingyas. This is um, in Burma, that uh, community which, which is being pushed out of the country because they are Muslims and they are being pushed to ba Bangladesh. I think so blockchain is used in this project in order to um, to preserve their identity on the blockchain and so no one can force this after after it's uh, it has an entry on the blockchain and so they have uh, I met I'm, I'm not an expert how exactly this project works but I imagine that um, through a barcode, uh, what is in on their ID, it, it, it's put on the blockchain. But uh, yeah, I invite you to check this out, uh, how, how that exactly works. And really a lot of blockchain for good projects are out there, but this is one which comes to my mind. Then another picture, which I have really vividly in my mind in Hong Kong, all the protests which were happening, maybe you guys seen on the news that um, I remember this, uh, this metro station and people are queuing in line in order to buy a metro ticket, uh, not through WeChat. WeChat is the app what they use for paying their electricity bills to chat with their friends, but also in order to, to buy um, subway tickets. And so because the government has access and is monitoring the apps, they can see where are you going or where, where are you buying your ticket to? So this is why people wanted to buy it with cash so that it's not documented or it's not traceable through WeChat. And I don't believe that this is going to happen soon, that cash is not going to exist in the next 50 years. I think we will still have cash. But if we don't have cash anymore, and, and we only can pay through WeChat, which is, of course, it's happening in China, it's not happening in Switzerland, then, then you know, it just goes to the direction of Big Brother and a Norwegian future to me, where everything I own is in this few cubic centimeters in my head, like as in my brain, but nothing else, because they know all my data. So, um, this is not just about capitalism, but, but privacy as well. Yeah, no, no, I see that. That's, that's clear. Yeah. 
Could you, um, because we have like a few minutes left, like just um, could you make a link to your feminist agenda that maybe the students have a, a more precise question about that? Yes, um, Emmy, we wanted to ask um, as co-founder of Women in Blockchain Switzerland, uh, what is your experience working in the tech industry? And is there something about blockchain specifically that allows it to have a positive impact on women in that industry? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when when you introduced me, then you said that I co-founded the Women in Blockchain Switzerland. So that happened because uh, when in 2017 started to go to, to all these meetups and, and the Crypto Valley events, uh, basically everyone uh, uh, was a developer uh, in hoodies and uh, and really like there were let's say 100 people but i could count on one hand how many how many um female are there and then i thought all oh, my friends should know about this exciting technology so uh, i want to involve them as well and this is why i just first created a facebook page and uh and then realized that it's not just only about gender diversity but diversity of cultures diversity of background and uh and and yeah we just uh, have this vision and mission of bringing more visibility onto the importance of this technology and piquing the interest of of all kinds of people, not just techy white male, but 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 really um, across across the board and across the table, everyone. And um, it's it's funny how how things change or, or how your view changes because I have been active in this women in blockchain Switzerland but but it's it's not an active uh, uh, part or not not a big part of my current uh, engagement because I believe that you cannot really push uh, diversity artificially so much I mean if 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 a human is interested in this technology then they will you know, go down the rabbit hole and then just Google everything out of it and, and they will um, make friends who work in this field and get inspired by them. Uh, I still believe though that, that diversity um, has a, a major positive impact on any workspace or any team. Um, the more diverse the group of people you are with, um, the more creative and, and more perspectives you can get. And to answer the question of if there are any blockchain related uh, projects, uh, absolutely. So Grassroots, for instance, which is a um, um, foundation uh, helping uh, communities in Africa uses blockchain in order to, to um, provide with payment for women who are setting up their little uh, jewelry shop, like handmade jewelry or, or um, any other kind of shops. And maybe in Africa, you guys don't know that, or not everyone knows that, that in these tribes, sometimes the women's money just like gets stolen or, or you know, someone threatens you to give me what you earned today uh, in the factory or, or in, in your work. And, and because how they get remunerated is not physical anymore, but it happens through the blockchain and they all have phones uh, and they just have their, their private keys. Only they know them, right? Because either they memorize it or, or, or they just, um, yeah, like hide it somewhere. I don't know how, how exactly it works through the, through the, um, the phone itself, because actually you don't need to have a smartphone in order to interact with the blockchain. You can do it just with, with GSM. Um, yeah, but but other than that, uh, how blockchain is uh, is um, linked to the social development goals. So maybe you guys know the VEF uh, is having these 17, I think it's 17, 17 social development goals. And one of them is diversity and, and yeah, uh, blockchain is used in that aspect, so to increase diversity. I hope this this answers uh, um, the question. It's just, if I may come quickly also back yeah. to, to uh, what you have said, um, Mr. Caruso. So, yeah, of course, and I think a utopia is in the most cases, uh, otherwise there would be already one being 
the world we live in is mostly naive. Uh, but basically, if you also picture, and this is now the other side, uh, if you challenge, for example, exactly why does it need to have a bank um, in this kind of peer-to-peer -peer world, of course, then you could also say, okay, a, a purely peer-to-peer -peer world, peer-to-peer -peer world at some point is, would also be maybe a little naive because it would be, of course, for society, it would be a win, but the, the technology is, is only one piece. And there's always, regardless which technology you use, if it's the abacus or still like what we do today, there are always bad actors and there's always people, you know, profit from others, exploiting, um, gain, gaining and finding ways. Uh, and this is actually the, the sad part about it. So unless of course, humankind changes um, and this is to, to, to be hoped. But in general, what is happening um, still, it, it takes a lot of, already now, it, it will take a lot of this kind of heat out of the balloon in terms of very few people and elites actually just taking a huge cut out of everything happening on this planet, just for the sake, because they have the power. So even though there will be some regulated players in the, in the as middle, let's not say middlemen, but rather the margins and, and let's say all the business models they need to adopt to the new world, to the new standard, new normal. There will be less and less of this being, you know, evaporating. So with that already in, in an aggregated world uh, or an aggregation, there will be more for more people, you know, more value for more people. So because you pay less, you get more, transparency is higher and, and, and some very few people will not just gain for the sake they are the few elites because otherwise inequality will rise and rise and hopefully technology helps to avoid that. I mean, not monopolize technology as we see it now, but decentralized technology. No, Did you guys see how he, he just hijacked the diversity question? Yeah, no, it's just because of the time because... <laughs> I'm joking, good. No, uh -huh, because... Yeah. See, it has this this huge potential to be an instrument for emancipation. It's clear and the way you're talking about it is in those terms and I really, I enjoy that. Um, but I guess I, I think you also always need a kind of political counterpart, you know, and I think we need, and obviously in the context of a new policy and your description of with WeChat in the Hong Kong protests, I mean, that was so market, you know, that if we all are, do everything with our phones and if the, and there's a lot of discussion, like in Britain, you know, they finally have this app to do with the COVID virus. Mm -hmm. Government has been so useless about everything. Um, I don't want to download that app. I'm happy to give every place I go my contact details, but I think there's a big potential that even unintentionally the government will, uh, you know, information will escape from their system because they're so, incompetent and so yes and, and it's clear how the the things that you're talking about have a have a big potential to even out the power that the the, the yeah the tech the, what's the word um the power that computers and 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 computing have now that are so centralized i mean I, it, that's clear um anyway we're did you want to say something emmy i just because we're yeah, and, and this is, uh, I don't know if you, if you read uh, Yuval Harari's uh, piece in the Financial Times, um, which, uh, which I'm also happy to throw into the chat, the world after coronavirus, and he's exactly touching base on this, what, what you said with the, with the app in the UK. Um, I recommend to, you every, to, to all of you to read it because it's such, a, such an important uh, piece to humanity. Anyhow, we've come to the end of our time. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I only slightly understand blockchain more than I did before, but slightly. I hope it didn't confuse you. Yeah.
I'm going to have to visit with you after the virus and you can give me a kind of more in-depth uh, briefing. But it was really fascinating. And I also think it was so different, but also covering so many of the same things as other subjects have been uh, looking at this week. It's really, really a valuable contribution to the mix of ideas we have this week. Um, so thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you so much. And Olga, please really uh, find a way, uh, like uh, Emily and, and Barbara has my email address. I really want to send you this five uh, to francs worth of Bitcoin. <laughs> we'll make sure you get... <laughs> That's the challenge now to open this wallet. Right? Set up a Bitcoin wallet, yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye for Bye. now. Bye, everyone.